The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so um, let me go back to what we were doing. What the plan for today is as follows. We're going to look at this unitary time evolution and calculate this operator, u, given the Hamiltonian. That will be the first order of business today. Then we will look at the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics. And uh, the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics is one where the operators, the Schrodinger operators, acquire time dependence. And uh, it's, it's a pretty useful picture, uh, way of, th of seeing things, a pretty useful way of calculating things um, as well, and uh, makes the relation between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics more obvious. Uh, so it's a very important tool, so we'll discuss that. We will find the Heisenberg equations of motion and solve them for a particular case today. All this material is not uh, to be covered in the test. Uh, the only part, of course, the first few things I will say today about solving for the unitary operator, you've done in other ways, and I will do it again this time. So. What we have is, uh, going back to what we were saying last time, we postulated unitary time evolution. We said that psi at t was given by some operator u of t, t naught, psi at time t naught. And then we found that this equation implied a Schrodinger equation with a Hamiltonian given by the following expression, ih du dt of tt naught, u dagger of tt naught. So that was our derivation of the Schrodinger equation. We started with the time evolution. We found that whenever we declare that states evolve in time in that way, they satisfy a first order time differential equation. Uh, of the Schrodinger form in which the Hamiltonian is related, is given in terms of u by this equation. And uh, we talked about this operator. First, we showed that it doesn't depend really on t naught. Then we showed that it's Hermitian, that has units of energy. And uh, as you may have seen already in the notes, there's a uh, very clear correspondence between this operator and the way um, the dynamics follows with the ideas of um, Poisson brackets that are the precursors of commutators from classical mechanics. So that's in the notes. I will not go in detail in this. Uh, many of you may have not heard of Poisson brackets. It's an interesting thing, and if you Really, that will be good enough. So our goal today is to find u given h. Because as we mentioned last time, uh, for physicists, it's typically more easy to invent a quantum system by postulating a Hamiltonian and then solving it than postulating a time evolution operator. So our goal in general is to find go find u of t t naught given h of t. That's what we're supposed to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, multiply this equation by u. So I will have, by multiplying this equation by a u from the right, I will write first this term, i h du dt of t t naught is equal to h of t u of t t naught. So I multiply this equation 
by a u from the right. This operator is unitary, so u dagger u is 1. That's why this equation cleaned up to this. Now, there's no confusion really here with derivatives, so I might as well write them with a normal derivative. So I'll write this equation as d dt of u t t naught is equal to h of t u of t t naught. This equation, you should be able to look at that equation and say, I see the Schrodinger equation there. How? Imagine that you have a psi of t naught here, and you put it in. Then the right-hand side becomes h and t acting on psi of t. And on the right hand side, on the left hand side, this psi of t naught can be put inside the derivative because it doesn't depend on t. Therefore, this becomes i h bar d d t of psi of t. So um, the Schrodinger equation is there. OK, so now let's solve this. We will consider three cases. Case one, h is time independent. So doing this sort of uh, quickly, so h of t is really h, like that. No explicit time dependence there. So what do we have? i h bar, let's write du dt is equal h times u. And we try to write a solution of the form u is equal to e to the minus i h t over h bar times u naught. Does that work? Well, uh, we can take du dt and i h, so we get i h. When I take du dt, I have to differentiate this exponential. And now in this exponential, this full operator h is there. But uh, we are differentiating with respect to time, and h doesn't depend on time. So this is not a very difficult situation. You could imagine the power series expansion, and h, as far as this derivative goes, uh, is like if it would be even a number. It wouldn't make any difference that it's an operator. So the derivative with respect to time of this thing is minus i h over h times the same exponential. Moreover, the position of this h could be here or could be to the right. It cannot be to the right of u0, though, because this is a matrix, a constant matrix that we've put in here as a possible thing for boundary conditions. So, so far, we've taken this derivative, and then the i's cancel, the h bar cancels, and you get h. But this whole thing is, again, u. So the equation has been solved. So try this, and it works. So uh, having this solution, we can write, for example, that uh, u of t t naught is going to be e to the minus i h t over h bar some, times some constant matrix. When t is equal to t naught, this matrix becomes the unit matrix. So this is e to the minus i h t naught over h bar times u naught. And therefore, from here, u naught 
is the inverse of this matrix, which is nothing else but e to the i h t naught over h bar. So I can substitute back here what u naught is, and finally obtain u of t t naught is e to the minus i h over h bar t minus t naught. And this is for h time independent. And that's our solution. There's very little to add to this. Uh, we discussed that in recitation on Thursday, this unitary operator. You've been seeing that from the beginning of the course in some sense, that you evolve energy eigenstates. If this acts on any energy eigenstate, uh, H is an energy, if you act here on an energy eigenstate, since uh, the energy eigenstate is an eigenstate precisely for H, you can put just the number here. That is e to the, say, alpha H on a state psi n is equal to e to the alpha e n psi n if h on psi n is equal to e n on psi n. So the function of an operator acting on an eigenstate is just the function evaluated at the eigenvalue. So this is a rule that you've been using for a really long time. OK, so when h is time independent, that's what it is. How about when h has a little time dependence? Uh, how, what do I call a little time dependence? Uh, a little time dependence is an idea designed to make it possible for you to solve the equation even though it has some time dependence. So you could have. Hamiltonians that are time dependent but still have a simplifying virtue. So H of T is time dependent, but assume that H at T1 and H at T2 commute for all T1 and T2. So what could that be? For example, you know that the particle in a magnetic field, the spin in a magnetic field, is minus gamma um, b dot um, the spin. And you could have a time-dependent magnetic field, b of t times the spin, I'm not sure this is the constant gamma that I usually call gamma, but it may be. Um, now, then, if the, time, if the magnetic field is time dependent, but imagine its direction is not time dependent. So if its direction is not time dependent, then, for example, you would have here minus gamma bz of t times sz. And the Hamiltonian at different times commute because SZ commutes with itself. And the fact that it's time dependent doesn't make it much, uh, doesn't make it uh, fail to commute. So if uh, you have a magnetic field that is fixed in one direction but changes in time, you can have a situation where your Hamiltonian is time dependent, but still at different times it commutes. And you will discuss such case because it's interesting. But uh, later on, as we do nuclear magnetic resonance, we will have the more interesting case in which the magnetic field rotates. And therefore, uh, it's not that simple. So what happens if you have uh, a time-dependent Hamiltonian that actually commutes? Well, the claim is that u of tt naught 
is given by a natural extension of what we had before, you would want to put the exponential of minus i h t. But the reason this worked was because the derivative with respect to time brought down an i h over h bar. So one way to fix this is to put t, t naught, h of t prime dt prime. So this is an ansatz, or try this. Look at this. If the Hamiltonian were to be time independent, you could take it out, and then you would get t minus t naught that brings you back to this case. So this looks reasonable. So let me call this quantity r of t. And then you notice that r dot of t, the derivative of this quantity with respect to time, well, when you differentiate an integral, the upper argument, you get just the integrand evaluated at the time represented by the upper argument of the upper limit of integration. So this is h of t. And now, here comes a crucial point. You're trying to differentiate this u is really e to the r. And you're trying to differentiate to see if the equation holds du dt. So what is du dt? It would be d dt of 1 plus r plus r r plus 1 3 factorial r r r. And now what happens? You differentiate here, and the first term is r dot. Here you would have 1 half r dot r plus r r dot. And then 1 over 3 factorial, but 3 factors, r dot r r plus r r dot r plus r r r dot. But here is the claim r dot commutes with r. Claim r dot and r commute. Why is that? Well, r dot depends on h. And r is an integral of h's. Well, but the h's at different times commute anyway, so this must be true. There's no place where you can get a contribution because r is dot is like an h, and here's an integral of h's. So since the Hamiltonians are assumed to commute, r dot commutes with r, and this becomes like a normal derivative of an exponential in which you can move the r dot to the left everywhere, and you're differentiating the usual thing. So this is r dot and times the exponential of r. So actually, that means that we've got uh, pretty much our answer, because r dot is minus i over h bar h of t, and e to the r is u. So we got du dt equal this, which is the same as this equation. So uh, the only reason a derivative with respect to time would not give the usual thing is if r and r dot fail to commute. And they don't. So you can put the r dot here. You can put the r dot on the other side, because it commutes with r. But it's better here. 
And uh, therefore, you've got this uh, very nice uh, solution. So the solution is not that bad. Now, finally, I want to discuss for a second the general case. General case. So that's case, um, oh, there was a 1, a 2, a 3. H of t general. What can you do? Well, if h of t is general, there's not too much you can do. You can write something that will get you started doing things, but it's not uh, obviously terribly useful. But uh, it's interesting anyway that there's a way to write something that makes sense. So here it is, uh, u of t and t naught. I'll write the answer and explain how it looks. And then you will see that uh, it's, it's OK, it's interesting, but uh, it probably is not the most practical way you can solve this problem. So, so here it is. It's, there's an acronym for this thing, T. It's called the time-ordered exponential. This operator does something to the exponential function. So it's a definition. So I have to say what this time-ordered exponential is. And uh, it's the following. You take the exponential and just begin to expand. So 1 minus i over h bar, or I'll put like this, plus minus i over h bar integral from t naught to t of uh, dt1, h of t1. So far, so good. I've just expanded this. Now, if I would continue expanding, I would get something that doesn't provide the solution. You see, this thing is the solution when the Hamiltonian at different times commute. So it's unlikely to be the solution when they don't commute. In fact, it's not the solution. So what is the next term here? The next term is you, you think of the exponential as you would expand as usual. So you would have here plus 1 half of this thing squared. So I will put something and then erase it. So maybe don't copy. 1 half minus i over h bar squared. And you would say, well, t naught to t dt prime h of t prime, t naught to t dt double prime h of double t prime. Well, that would be just an exponential. So what is a time-ordered exponential? You erase the 1 half. And then for notation, call this t1 and t1. And then the next integral, do it only up to time t1 and call this t2. So t1 will always be greater than t2 because t2 is integrated from t0 to t1. And as you integrate here over the various t1s, you just integrate up to that value. So you're doing less of the full integral than you should be doing, and that's why the factor of 1 half has disappeared. This can be continued. I could write the next one would be minus i over h bar cubed integral t naught to t dt1 h of t1 integral t naught to t1 dt2 h of t2 and then the next integral goes up to t2 so t naught to t2 dt3 h of t3 Anyway, that's a time-ordered exponential. And uh, 
I leave it to you to take the time derivative of that and at least to see that the first few terms are working exactly the way they should. That is, if you take a time derivative of this, you will get h times that thing. So since it's a power series, you will differentiate the first term, and you will get the right thing, then the second term, and you will start getting everything that you need. So, so it's a funny object. Uh, it's reassuring that something like this exists. But in general, you would want to be able to do all these integrals and to sum them up. And in general, it's not that easy. So uh, it's of limited usefulness. It's a nice thing that you can write it, and you can prove things about it, and, and uh, manipulate it. But when you have a practical problem, generally, that's not the way you solve it. In fact, when we will discuss the rotating magnetic fields for magnetic resonance, we will not solve it in this way. Um, we will try to figure out the solution in some other way. But in terms of completeness, it, it's kind of pretty in that you go from the exponential to the time-ordered exponential. And I think you'll see more of this in 806. So that's basically our solution for h and um, for the unitary operator u in terms of h. And what we're going to do now is turn to the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics. Yes, questions? Why? Uh, yeah, because that's really a property of integrals. d d x integral up to x from x zero, g of x prime d x prime, is just equal to g at x. This is a constant here, so you're not varying the integral over in this limit. So. If this limit would also be x dependent, you would get another contribution. But we only get the contribution from here. What's really happening is you're integrating up to x, then up to x plus epsilon, subtracting. So you pick up the value of the function at the upper limit. Yes? So what happens to the t? It's like t factor slash. What happens to this t? Yeah. Well, yeah. That's just a symbol. It says. Time ordered the following exponential. So at this stage, this is a, a definition of what t on an exponential means. Okay. It's not, uh, let me say, t is not an operator in the usual sense of quantum mechanics or anything like that. It's an instruction. Whenever you have an exponential of this form, the time ordered exponential is this series that we've written down. It's just a definition. Yes? So when we have operators in differential equations, uh, do we still get unique distributions? If we have what? Uh, so when we have operators in differential equations, do we still get uniqueness of solutions? Yes, pretty much. Uh, because it's uh, at the end of the day, this is a first order matrix differential equation. So it's a collection of first order differential equations for every element of a matrix. So everything, it's pretty much as the same as you have before. If you know the operator at any time, initial time, with the differential equation, you know the operator at a little bit time later. So the operator is completely determined if you know it initially and the differential equation. So I think it's completely analogous. It's, it's just that it's harder to solve. Nothing else. One last question. So let's say that we can somehow find this unitary operator, and then we have our differential equation, and we somehow, let's say, get an, a wave function out of it. Um, is there, what is really the interpretation of that wave function? Because Well, it's not that we get the wave function out of this. What, uh, what really is happening is that you have learned how to calculate this operator given h. And therefore, now you're able to evolve any wave function. So 
you have solved the dynamical system. If somebody tells you at time equals zero, your system is here, you can now calculate where it's going to be at a later time. So that's really all you have achieved. You, you now know the solution. When you do in mechanics and they ask you for an orbit problem, they say, at this time the planet is here. What are you supposed to find? X as a function of time. You now know how it's going to develop. You've solved equations of motion. Here it's the same. You know the wave function at time equals zero. If you know it at any time, you've solved the problem. OK, so Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics. Heisenberg picture. So basically, the Heisenberg picture exists thanks to the existence of the, Heis of the Schrodinger picture. Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics is not something that you necessarily invent from the beginning. The way we think of it is we assume there is a Schrodinger picture that we've developed in which we have operators like x, p, spin, Hamiltonians, and wave functions. And then we are going to define a new way of thinking about this, which is called the Heisenberg picture of the quantum mechanics. So it all begins by considering a Schrodinger operator, AS hat, which is S is for Schrodinger. And the motivation comes from expectation values. Suppose you have time-dependent states, in fact, matrix elements. One time-dependent state alpha of t, one time-dependent state beta of t. Two independent time-dependent states. So you could ask, what is the matrix element of A between these two time-dependent states, a matrix element. But then, armed with our unitary operator, we know that AS is here, and this state beta at time t is equal to u of t comma 0 beta at time 0. And alpha at t is equal to alpha at 0 u dagger of t 0. So the states have time dependence, and, but the time dependence has already been found, say, in principle, if you know u dagger. And then you can speak about the time, the time dependent matrix elements of the operator AS, or the matrix element of this time dependent operator between the time equals zero states. And this operator is sufficiently important that this operator is called the Heisenberg version of the operator S. Has time dependence and it's defined by this equation. So whenever you have um, Schrodinger operator, whether it be time dependent or time independent, whatever the Schrodinger operator is, I have now a definition of what I will call the Heisenberg operator. And it is obtained by acting with the unitary operator, u, and the uh, operators always act on operators from the left and from the right. That's something that operators act on states from the left, they act on the state, but uh, operators act on operators from the left and from the right, as you see them here. Is the natural, ideal thing to happen. If you have an operator that's on another from the right only or from the left only, 
I think you have grounds to be suspicious that maybe you're not doing things right. So this is the Heisenberg operator. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of things to be said about this operator. So let's begin with the remark. Are there questions about this Heisenberg operator? Yes. You have to speak louder. Uh, is a Schrodinger operator related to the Hamiltonian or something? No, no, it's a, any Schrodinger operator. This could be the Hamiltonian. This could be x hat. It could be SZ. It could be any of the operators you know. All the operators you know are Schrodinger operators. So remarks, comments. OK, comments. One, at t equals 0, H Heis A Heisenberg becomes identical to A Schrodinger. At t equals 0. So I So look why, because when t is equal to 0, u of t uh, of 0, 0 is the operator that propagates no state. So it's equal to the identity. So this is a wonderful relation that tells you that at time equals 0, the two operators are really the same. Another simple remark, uh, if you have the unit operator in the Schrodinger picture, what is the unit operator in the Heisenberg picture? Well, it would be u t0 dagger 1 u t0, but 1 doesn't matter. u dagger with u is 1. This is a 1 Schrodinger, and therefore it's the same operator. So the Unit operator is the same. It just doesn't change whatsoever. OK, so that's good. But now something interesting also happens. Suppose you have a Schrodinger operator C that is equal to the product of A with B, two Schrodingers. If I try to figure out what is CH, I would put U dagger, avoid all the letters the T0. It's supposed to be T0, CS, U. But that's equal U dagger AS, BS, U. But now, in between the two operators, you can put a u dagger, a u u dagger, which is equal to 1. So a s u u dagger b s u. And then you see why this is really nice. Because what you get is that c Heisenberg is just a Heisenberg times b Heisenberg. So if you have. C Schrodinger equal A Schrodinger B Schrodinger. C Heisenberg is A Heisenberg B Heisenberg. So there is a nice correspondence between those operators. Also, you can do this for commutators so that you don't have to worry about this thing. So for example, if A Heisenberg, A Schrodinger with B Schrodinger is equal to C Schrodinger, then by doing exactly the same things, you see that A Heisenberg with B Heisenberg would be the commutator equal to C Heisenberg. Yes? That argument for the uh, identity operators being the same in both pictures. Uh, if the Hamiltonian is time independent, 
Does that work for any operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian? Hamiltonian is not work for any operator. Because then you can push the operator just through the exponential of the Hamiltonian. Yeah, we'll see things like that. I'm, I'm not sure if I would stay. We could discuss that maybe a little later. But there are some cases, as we will see immediately, in which some operators are the same in the two pictures. So basically, operators that commute with the Hamiltonian, as you say, since h, since u, involves the Hamiltonian, and this is the Hamiltonian. If the operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, you can move them across, and they are the same. So I think, yeah, it's definitely true. So we will have uh, an interesting question, in fact, whether the Heisenberg Hamiltonian is equal to the Schrodinger Hamiltonian, and we'll answer that very soon. So the one example that here I think you should keep in mind is this one. You know this is true. So what do you know in the Heisenberg picture? That x Heisenberg of t times p Heisenberg of t commutator is equal to the Heisenberg version of this. But here was the unit operator. And therefore, um, this is just i h bar times the unit operator again, because the unit operator is the same in all pictures. So this commutation relation is true for any Heisenberg operator. Whatever commutation relation you have of Schrodinger, it's true for Heisenberg as well. OK, so then let's talk about Hamiltonians. Three Hamiltonians. So. Heisenberg Hamiltonian, by definition, would be equal to u dagger t0 Schrodinger Hamiltonian times u of t0. So if the Schrodinger Hamiltonian actually, if hs at t1 commutes with hs at t2, See, if the Schrodinger Hamiltonian is such that for all t1 and t2, they commute with each other, remember, if that is the case, the unitary operator is anyway built by an exponential. It's this one. And the Schrodinger Hamiltonians commute. So as was asked in the question before, this thing commutes with that, and you get that they are the same. So if this is happening, the two Hamiltonians are identical. And uh, we'll have the chance to check this today in a nice example. So I will write this as saying that the Heisenberg Hamiltonian as a function of time then is equal to the Schrodinger Hamiltonian as a function of time. And this goes if hs of t1 and hs of t2 commute. OK. Uh, now, I want you to notice this thing. Whenever I suppose the, highs, the hs of t is some hs of x, p, and t, for example. OK? Now you come and turn it into Heisenberg by putting a u dagger from the left and a u from the right. What will that do? It will put the u dagger from the left, u dagger on the right. And then it will start working its, its way inside. And 
any x that it will find will turn into a Heisenberg x. Any p will turn into a Heisenberg p. Imagine, for example, any Hamiltonian that is some function of x. It has an x squared. Well, the u dagger and u come and turn this into x, x Heisenberg squared. So what I claim here, here happens is that h Heisenberg of t is equal to u dagger h Schrodinger of x p t u. And therefore, this becomes h Schrodinger of x Heisenberg of t, p Heisenberg of t, and t. So here is what the Heisenberg Hamiltonian is. It's the Schrodinger Hamiltonian where x's and p's or spins and everything has become Heisenberg. So the equality of the two Hamiltonians is a very funny condition on the Schrodinger Hamiltonian because this is supposed to be equal to the Schrodinger Hamiltonian, which is of x, p, and t. So it is, you have a function of x, p, and t, and you put x Heisenberg, p Heisenberg, and somehow the whole thing is the same. So this is a, something very useful, and we'll need it. One more comment, uh, expectation values. So this is three, um, I'll comment number four on expectation values, which is something you've already, it's sort of the way we began the discussion. And I um, want to make sure it's clear. So uh, four expectation values. So we started with this with alpha and beta two arbitrary straights, matrix elements. Take them equal and to be equal to psi of t. So you would have psi t a s psi t is in fact equal to psi 0 a Heisenberg psi 0. Now, that is a key equation. You know, you're doing an expectation value at any given time of a Schrodinger operator, turn it into Heisenberg and work at time equals 0. It simplifies life tremendously. Now, this is the key identity. It's the way we motivated everything, in a way. And uh, it's written in a way that maybe it's a little too, sh too schematic, but we write it this way. We just say the expectation value of AS is equal to the expectation value of AH. And this, well, we save time like that, but you have to know what you mean. When you're computing the expectation value of a Schrodinger operator, you're using time-dependent states. When you're computing the expectation value of the Heisenberg operator, you're using the time equals zero version of the states, but they are the same. So we say that the Schrodinger expectation value is equal to the Heisenberg expectation value. We write it like in the bottom, but uh, we mean the top equation, and um, we use it that way. So the Heisenberg operators at this moment are a little mysterious. They are supposed to be given by this formula, but we've seen that calculating u can be difficult, so calculating the Heisenberg operator can be difficult sometimes. So what we try to do in order to simplify that is find an equation that is satisfied by the Heisenberg operator. 
a time derivative equation. So let's try to find an equation that is satisfied by the Heisenberg operator rather than a formula. You say, well, this is better, but the fact is that seldom you know u, and even if you know u, you have to do this simplification, which is hard. So finding a differential equation for the operator is useful. So differential equation for Heisenberg operators. So what do we want to do? We want to calculate um, I h bar ddt of the Heisenberg operator. And uh, what do we get? Well, we have several things. Remember, the Schrodinger operator can have a bit of time dependence. Uh, the time dependence would be an explicit time dependence. So let's take the time derivative of all this. So you would have three terms, i h bar du dagger dt a s u plus u dagger a s du dt plus, with an i h bar, plus um, u dagger i h bar d a s d t. I'm sorry, I, yeah, d, d a s d t and u. So, Well, you have these equations. Those were the Schrodinger equations we started with today. The derivatives of u or the derivatives of u dagger. So what did we have? Well, we had that ih bar du dt was h u, h Schrodinger times u. And therefore, i h bar du dagger dt, I take the dagger of this, I would get a minus sign, I'll put it on the other side, is equal to u dagger h s with a minus here. And all the u's are u's of t and t naught. Now I run out of this thick chalk. So we'll continue with thin chalk. Um, all right, so we are here. We wrote the time derivative, and we have three terms to work out. So what are they? Well, we have this thing, ih bar this. So let's write it, ih bar d dt of a s, of a Heisenberg, I'm sorry, is equal to, that term is minus u dagger h s a Schrodinger u. The next term, plus i h bar d u d t on the right, so we have plus u dagger a s h s um, the u d t so u well that's not bad it's actually quite nice and then the last term which I have very little to say because uh, in general this is a derivative of a time dependent operator partial with respect to time, it would be zero if a s depends just say on x or on p or on s x or any of those things, it has to have a particular t. So I will just leave this as plus i h bar d a s d t Heisenberg. 
the Heisenberg version of this operator using the definition that anything, any operator that you have a U dagger in front, a U to the right, is the Heisenberg version of the operator. So I think I'm doing all right with this equation. So what did we have? Here it is, I h bar d d t of A Heisenberg of T. And now comes the nice thing, of course. Uh, this thing, look at it, U dagger U. This turns everything here into Heisenberg. H Heisenberg, A Heisenberg. Here you have A Heisenberg, H Heisenberg. And what you got is the commutator between them. So this thing is A Heisenberg commutator with H Heisenberg. That whole thing. And then you have plus I H bar D A S D T Heisenberg. So that is the Heisenberg equation of motion. That is how you can calculate a Heisenberg operator, if you want. Um, you try to solve this differential equation, and many times that's the simplest way to calculate the Heisenberg operator. So there you go. It's a pretty important equation. So Let's uh, consider particular cases immediately to just get some intuition. So remarks, suppose A, S has no explicit time dependence. So basically, there's no explicit t, and therefore this derivative goes away. So the equation becomes i h bar d a s d a h, of course, d t is equal to a h Heisenberg sub h of t. And you know the Heisenberg operator is supposed to be simpler, simple if the Schrodinger operator is time independent, is identical to the Schrodinger Hamiltonian, even if the Schrodinger operator has time dependence but they commute, this will become the Schrodinger Hamiltonian. But we can leave it like that. It's, um, it's a nice thing anyway. Uh, time dependence of expectation values. So let me do a little um, remark on time dependence of expectation values. So suppose you have the usual thing that you want to compute. How does the expectation value of a Schrodinger operator depend on time? You're faced with that expectation value of AS. And it changes in time. And you want to know how you can compute that. Well, you first say, OK, the IH bar DDT. But this thing is nothing but psi 0 A Heisenberg of T psi 0. Now I can let the derivative go in. So this becomes a psi 0, i h bar d a h d t psi 0. And using this, assuming that a is still no time dependence, a has no explicit time dependence. Then you can use just this equation, which gives you psi 0, a h, h h, psi 0. So all in all, 
what have you gotten? You've gotten a rather simple thing, the time derivative of the expectation value, so i h bar d d t, and now I, I write the left-hand side as just the expectation value of h Heisenberg of t. No, the left-hand side has the a Schrodinger expectation value, but we, we call those expectation values the same thing as a Heisenberg expectation value. So this thing becomes the right-hand side is the expectation value of A Heisenberg, H Heisenberg, like that. And just the way we say that Heisenberg expectation values are the same as Schrodinger expectation values, you could as well write it, if you prefer, as DDT of A Schrodinger is equal to the expectation value of A Schrodinger with H Schrodinger. It's really the same equation. This equation we derived a couple of lectures ago. And now we know that the expectation values of Schrodinger operators are the same as the expectation values of their Heisenberg counterparts, except that the states are taken at time equals zero. So you can use either form of this equation. The bottom one is one that you've already seen. The top one now looks almost obvious from the bottom one. But it really took quite a bit uh, to get it. One last comment on these operators. Um, how about conserved operators? What are those things? A time independent, dependent, AS is said to be conserved, be conserved if it commutes with the Schrodinger Hamiltonian. If AS commutes with HS equals zero. Now you know that uh, if AS with HS is zero, AH with HH is zero because the map between Heisenberg and Schrodinger pictures says a commutator that is valid in the Schrodinger picture is valid in the Heisenberg picture by putting H's. So what you realize from this is that this thing, this implies AH commutes with HH. And therefore, by point one, by one, you have DAH dt is equal to zero. And uh, this is nice, actually. The Heisenberg operator is actually time independent. It just doesn't depend on time. So a Schrodinger operator, it's a funny operator. It doesn't have time in there. It has x's, p's, spins, and you don't know in general if it's time independent in the sense of, conserve, of uh, expectation values. But whenever AS commutes with HS, well, the expectation values don't change in time. But as you know, this DDT can be brought in because the states are not time dependent. So the fact that this is zero means the operator, Heisenberg operator, is really time independent. Whenever you have a Schrodinger operator has no t, the Heisenberg one can have a lot of t. But if the operator is conserved, then the Heisenberg operator will have no t's after all. It will really be conserved. 
So uh, let's use our last 10 minutes to do an example and uh, illustrate much of this. In the notes, there will be three examples. Uh, I will do just one in lecture. You can do the other ones in recitation next week. There's no need, really, that you study these things uh, at this moment. Just try to get whatever you can now from the lecture, and in the next week, you'll go back to this. So the example is the harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator, and it will illustrate the ideas very nicely, I think. The Schrodinger Hamiltonian is p squared over 2m plus 1 half m omega squared x hat squared. OK, I could put x Schrodinger and p Schrodinger, but that would be just far too much. x and p are the operators you've always known. They are Schrodinger operators. So we leave them like that. Now I have to write the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Well, what is the Heisenberg Hamiltonian? Mm. Yes? Sorry? Identical. Identical? Yes, but I will leave that for a little later. I will just assume, well, I'm supposed to do u dagger u. And as, as you said, this is a time-independent Hamiltonian. It better be the same. But it will be clearer if we now write what it should be in general. We have a u dagger and a u from the right. They come here, and they turn this into p Heisenberg over 2m plus 1 half m omega squared x Heisenberg. OK. That's your Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And we will check, in fact, that it's time independent. So how about the operators x Heisenberg and p Heisenberg? What are they? Well, I don't know how to get them unless I do this sort of U thing that uh, doesn't look too bad, but certainly would be messy. You would have to do an exponential of e to the minus iht over t with the x operator and another exponential. Sounds a little complicated. So let's do it the way the equations of, of the Heisenberg operators tell you. Well, x and p are time-independent Schrodinger operators, so that equation that I box holds. So i h dx Heisenberg dt is nothing else than x Heisenberg commuted with h Heisenberg. OK. Can we do that commutator? Yes. Because x Heisenberg, as you remember, just commutes with p Heisenberg. So instead of the Hamiltonian, you can put this. This is x Heisenberg p Heisenberg squared over 2m. OK, well, x Heisenberg and p Heisenberg is like you had x and p. So what is this commutator? You probably know it by now. You're you act with this on these two p's, so it acts on one, acts on the other, gives the same on each. So you get a p Heisenberg times the commutator of x and p, which is i h bar, times a factor of two. So uh, you can put hats better, maybe. Um, and then what do we get? Um, the IH there and the IH cancels. And we get some nice equation that says dx Heisenberg dt is 1 over m p Heisenberg. Well, it actually looks like an equation in classical mechanics. dx dt is p over m. So that's the good thing about the Heisenberg equations of motion. They look like ordinary equations for dynamical variables. 
Well, we've got this one. Let's get p. Well, we didn't get the operator still, but we got an equation. So how about p dp dt? So i h dp Heisenberg dt would be p Heisenberg with h Heisenberg. And this time, only the potential term in here matters. So it's p Heisenberg with 1 half m omega squared x Heisenberg squared. So what do we get? We get 1 half m omega squared. Then we get, again, a factor of 2. Then we get 1 left over xh. And then a p with xh, which is a minus ih bar. So the ih bars cancel, and we get dph dt is equal to the h bar cancel m omega squared xh minus m. All right, so these are our Heisenberg equations of motion. So how do we solve for them now? Well, you sort of have to try the kind of things that you would do classically. Take a second derivative of this equation, d second xh dt squared would be equal 1 over m dph dt. And dph dt would be min 1 over m times minus m omega squared xh. So d second xh dt squared is equal to minus omega squared xh. Exactly the equation of motion of a harmonic oscillator. It's really absolutely nice uh, that you recover those equations that uh, you had before, except that um, now you're talking operators, and it's going to simplify your life quite dramatically when you try to use these operators. Because in a sense, solving for the time-dependent uh, Heisenberg operators is the same as finding the time evolution of all states. This time the operators change and you will know what they change like. So you have this and then you write xh is equal to a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t, where a and b are some time-independent operator, so xh of t. Well, that's the solution. How about what is p? pH of t would be m dx m dx dt, so you get minus m omega sine omega t a plus m omega cosine omega t b. OK, so that's it. That is the most general solution. But it still doesn't look like what you would want, does it? No, because you haven't used the time equals zero conditions. At time equals zero, the Heisenberg operators are identical to the Schrodinger operators. So at t equals zero, xh of t becomes a, but that must be x hat, the Schrodinger operator. And at t equals zero, pH of t becomes equal to, this is 0, m omega b. And that must be equal to the p hat operator. 
So actually, from, we have already now A and B. So B from here is P hat over M omega. And therefore, xh of t is equal to a, which is x hat cosine omega t, plus b, which is p hat over m omega sine omega t, and ph of t is here. A is um, pH of t is m omega b, which is m omega is p, so it's p hat cosine omega t minus m omega x hat sine omega t. So let's see, I hope I didn't make mistakes, p hat minus m omega x hat sine omega t. Yep, this is correct. This is your whole solution for the Heisenberg operator. So any expectation value of any power of x and p that you will want to find its time dependence, just put those Heisenberg operators and you will calculate things with the states at time equals zero. It will become very easy. So the last thing I want to do is uh, complete uh, the promise that we had about the, what is the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Well, we had the Heisenberg Hamiltonian there, and now we know the Heisenberg operators in terms of the Schrodinger one. So HH of t is equal to pH 1 over 2m pH squared. So I have p hat cosine omega t minus m omega x hat sine omega t squared plus 1 half m omega squared xh squared, so x hat cosine omega t plus p hat over m omega sine omega t squared. So that's what the Heisenberg Hamiltonian is. So let's uh, simplify this. Well, let's square these things. You'll have 1 over 2m cosine squared omega t p hat squared. Let's do the square of this one. You would have plus 1 over 2m m squared omega squared sine squared omega t x squared. And then we have the cross product, which would be plus, or actually minus, 1 over 2m, the product of these two things, m omega sine omega t, cosine omega t, and you have px plus xp. OK, I squared the first uh, terms. Now the second one, well, let's square the p squared here. What do we have? 1 half m omega squared over m squared omega squared sine squared of omega t p squared. The x plus 1 half m omega squared cosine squared omega t x squared. And the cross term, plus 1 half m omega squared over m omega times uh, 
cosine omega t, sine omega t, xp plus px. Whew, a little bit of work, but what do we get? Uh, 1 over 2m, and here we must have 1 over 2m, correct, 1 over 2m, sine squared omega t, p squared, so this is equal 1 over 2m, p squared. This one's, uh, here you have 1 half m omega squared, so it's 1 half m omega squared, cosine and sine squared is x hat squared. And then here we have omega over 2, and here omega over 2, same factors, same factors, opposite signs. Very good. Schrodinger Hamiltonian. So you confirm that this theoretical expectation is absolutely correct. And what's the meaning? You have the Heisenberg Hamiltonian written in terms of the Heisenberg variables. But by the time you substitute these Heisenberg variables in, it just becomes identical to the Schrodinger Hamiltonian. All right, so that's all for today. I hope to see you in office hours uh, in the coming days. Be here Wednesday, 12.30, maybe 12.25 would be better, and uh, we'll see you then. All right. Thank you.